All right, we're live on Facebook. I am letting everybody in. Start the broadcast. Hey guys, welcome. We'll let you guys kind of pile on in right quick. All right, you guys, welcome, welcome. We're going to get started as you guys pile on in. Welcome back to another episode of the URS Virtual STEM Class slash Conversations brought to you by Team Chevy. Um, and we have a super duper special guest today. We're super excited. Um, Ed Welburn has been a friend of the racing school for many, many, many years now. And as a matter of fact, at our um, 21st award ceremony, we gave Ed the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, Ed uh, was at this point because he's retired now with he was GM's chief global um, uh, design person for 44 years. That's huge. That's huge. And that's such a, you know, an inspiring career. And we also have with us um, someone who we absolutely love, who is family to the racing school. And uh, Mr. Jim Campbell, right from Team Chevy, is here with us today. So this is so awesome. So as you guys pile in, I'll just go over some of the house cleaning rules. We're going to have a slight, conver a quick conversation um, with Mr. Welburn. And then you guys already know, put your hands up when we're ready to put you guys up one at a time. I will make you a panelist so that you guys can ask your questions. And of course, we will have our insane lightning round at the end of the conversation. All right, so Ed, be ready to answer some uh, <laughs> would you rather type of questions. And these are kind of special because I read up on you. So I think you're gonna really get a kick out of it when we finally do it. But with that said, I'm gonna hand it over, of course, to our host, which is Anthony Martin, our founder, and John Cohen, um, owner of NASCAR team, um, New York Racing, to get this conversation started. All right, guys, let's go. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. This is a very, very exciting time for us um, to have uh, Mr. Ed Wellborn on today and Mr. Jim Campbell, um, for sure, and um, uh, John Cohen, who's my partner in crime, who's here with us too. So we're, we are excited today. We don't want to do a lot of talking. We want to we get right to these, guys, to these gentlemen, uh, especially Mr. Wellborn, to um, get into basically what he does, who he is. And believe me, we, this is a very special treat to have this gentleman on, believe me. So make sure you enjoy it today. Ask as many questions as you possibly can today and have a good day today. John Cohen. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you, Ed, for coming out, taking out the time to speak to the kids. Um, I'm sure they really appreciate it. And thanks, Jim, for coming out today. Um, the, you know, the experience, what we're trying to do to embellish on the kids further in the education with the youth school. So um, Michelle, if you want to start. Sure, absolutely. So Ed, I was going through your whole bio, right? And just kind of, I've known you for a long time, yeah. um, but can you tell us a little bit about, because a lot of the students that we have are really young. And what I noticed that you started designing at eight years old. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Like what inspired you at eight years old to start designing cars? Okay, I'll do that. Well, first off, good morning, everyone. And uh, I should be thanking you for inviting me to be a part of this today. And, and I should thank Chevrolet for being a sponsor and being very much involved. I understand Chevy's been involved for like 20 years, which is very cool. Years. To have that kind of commitment is very cool. Uh, my story, uh, designing cars, goes back quite a ways and I've got to show you one thing when I was two and a half years old I was drawing when other young kids toddlers were drawing stick figures of horses and people and of buildings I was drawing cars wait, 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 and, wait. because at two years old we were not even drawing stick figures <laughs> well <laughs> one day we not that at two. one one day when there was no paper around because my parents were always entertained by me drawing. I mean, they're very simple. It's like an oval with two wheels right. and a door and a door, like a door to a house. 
Well, one day there was no paper around. So I went to my mother's extensive bookshelves and I took that first page and I drew a car. And I went through her whole bookshelves drawing cars. So we never got, my mother not, never got rid of her books. And at the time she was really angry when she saw what I did. <laughs> In later years, when I became a you know, designer at General Motors, she was proud to show off these drawings to everyone that, that she knew. But you know, she never got rid of her books. So I still have my drawings from when I was under three years old. Wow. Um, but wow. my passion for car design, yeah, is something that has been with me. I've had this like tunnel vision almost, this focus on designing cars. You know, eight, age eight at the Philadelphia Auto Show, I saw this dream car that totally blew me away. And I said, you know, to my parents right then and there, I was eight years old, I said, when I grew up, I wanted to design cars for that company. I didn't know what company it was. I later found out that it was the Cadillac Cyclone was the concept car. And uh, through reading magazines, see, as a kid, I was a very slow reader. And my mother tried everything to help me read better. I had special classes on weekends and during the summers when other kids were out playing, I was going to special classes you know, for reading development. And then she decided that since I was crazy about cars, that she would get me subscriptions to car magazines. By age 11, I had subscriptions to Road and Track, Hot Rod, Car Craft. I was a member of the National Hot Rod Association at age 11. I was getting all of this stuff in and reading it from cover to cover. And in reading those magazines, I found out where that Cadillac was designed and uh, wrote my first letter to General Motors telling them when I grow up, I want to be a car designer. What is it that I need to do? What, what kind of courses? Is this art? Is this engineering? What is it? And they sent me great information. Just the other day, going through all my stuff, I found a letter that I received when I was age 16 because I stayed in touch with them. I, I got the first letter from them, I stayed in touch with them at age 16. I got another letter giving me more information because I was getting closer to graduating from high school. And I, and I stayed close to them, went to Howard University, which is a whole nother great story and uh, did a summer internship with GM. And uh, from then on, I was, uh, you know, at the end of that summer internship, they just said, go back and complete your senior year. We really want to hire you. Uh, to be honest, I haven't, I've never had a job interview. <laughs> so, I, I, because right after graduation from Howard University, I went back to GM and spent my entire career there, 44 years. The last 13 years of which I was the head of design uh, globally. And uh, it was an incredible experience. I hate the word retirement. I'm not retired. I'm not sitting in some you know, village someplace. I'm not, I don't even play golf. I, I'd rather say that I have graduated from the, one of the finest schools of higher education, General Motors, and I'm now putting what I've learned at GM into practice. And this new chapter of my life is very full. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I spent a lot of time here. This is my office here at home. And this is where I sketch, I draw, I do design work. I'm, uh, I've got this passion for sketching athletic shoes. And I've really been looking at what is the next generation of athletic shoes. I've got a lot of sketches. I've I'm sure I've done over 50 sketches in that area. Uh, I'm a design advisor. Yes. Real quick, Ed, before we get into that, yes. I want to walk backwards a little bit. Um, first of all, congrats on graduating from an HBCU because HU, I'm an I'm a, I'm a HU mama because okay. my son graduated from Howard. Um, but I, there's a certain things that you talked about that I think our students could really um, take heed to. One was that you were extremely persistent at such a young age. 
Absolutely. Right. Like you're writing letters to General Motors at 11 and at 16. And you pretty much from, I guess, as long as you can remember, have pretty much dived into what you want, into your passion from a young age. And it just kind of grew from there. So I think that the kids should understand that the persistence um, of doing what you want to do. And of course, there's other people, right? But you went ahead and whatever barrier you had, you, yeah. you had tunnel vision and you focused and you were able to like overcome every, whether whatever it was, you know, getting through high school, then getting through college, then going into General Motors. And like you said, you've never, that's been your life, right? GM has been your life. So congratulations on that. Thank but you. definitely the hard work, because that was, a, what I hear is a lot of hard work. And I don't want to say the word sacrifice, but you definitely you. decided that instead of doing certain things that other kids and teenagers were doing, you kind of remind me of like a Michael Jordan of car design, right? Well, well <laughs> that's quite a compliment. Thank you. Uh, but, you know, really think about um, Olympic athletes. They didn't at age 18 decide, I want to go to the Olympics. Right. You know, they, they got involved in the particular sport that they did at a very early age. Yeah. Uh, my sport, my passion was car design. And, you know, I stayed very close to it. I read everything I could read. I was sketching, I was building model cars. My father had an auto body repair shop. I used to hang around that. He didn't want me to get too close to that business, so he wouldn't let me stay there long. That was okay because I'd get on my bike and I'd go to other garages. He never knew that, but I'd go to other garages and, and just watch them work and learn from them. Bill Jenkins' garage was in our town. Roger Penske's very first garage was not far from where I grew up as well. Yeah. Well, can you can you tell us a little bit more about um, I know that you're a designer and one of the things that you always talk about because a lot of the kids that come through the racing school, you know, they'll go to college and they're becoming engineers. I have a lot of students who are becoming engineers, but then I do have students that, you know, want to design cars like, you know, everything that we do, they always have to design something. So even in the class that John and um, Anthony are doing on Wednesdays. The first thing that they did was design this car scheme, this racing car scheme. So can you just kind of go over a little bit, what's the difference between an engineer and a car designer like you? And um, how many of you are there on the planet? <laughs> Gee, uh, yeah, challenging questions. First off, that relationship between a creative designer and a very creative, innovative engineer is so important. Unless you have that great relationship and they're on the same page, you're not gonna get a great product. You're just not gonna get it. So you have to have, it's gotta, there's a balance and it's a very careful balance. If it goes too much one way or the other, the product can suffer. If you're focused so much on design that engineering takes a back seat, then maybe the quality won't be what it should. Or if you go too far the other way with engineering, then you can end up with a product that doesn't look appealing at all. Design is, design is very artistic, but there is a difference between design and styling. To style a car is purely to make it look beautiful. But to design it, you're really thinking about how it functions and, and how it really, how all the elements work together. And you're working with the engineers and, and there's a wide variety of engineers, you know, from mechanical engineering to, you know, all the different forms of electrical engineering that uh, are in that area. But the biggest thing is how they work together as a team. That's awesome. So we have a special guest in here today who is an absolute Chevrolet guy. So I'm going to bring him and I'm going to ask him to start his camera because he just got in here and, and we just love this man to death. Yes. He's also a friend of the race. Hey, there he is, James J.B. Brown from CBS. Yes. Wow. wow. <laughs> First of all, none of the big wigs 
from Chevy would even think about having me do more endorsements for them if I can't figure out the modern technology. I am so old school, but thank you for your patience. <laughs> Mr. Campbell and Mr. Walburn, I know my 30 year old niece, who's the tech genius, is like Uncle James. It's not that difficult. So. <laughs> Hey, I'm kind of in the same boat with you. Uh, <laughs> off, ca off camera is a young man, Eli is, you know, he is my safety net. <laughs> so, uh, Jay well, Mr. Uh, Walburn, hey, just call me an absolute pleasure to be here with you. Well, you know what, the way my mother raised us, and I'm sure you're familiar with that, until you told to do that, it is Mr. And the same with Mr. Campbell, who I had the pleasure of being connected with by uh, Anthony a couple of weeks ago. Now, if I had known that you were gonna be in tuxedo, Ed, I would have put my tuxedo on. And I know that you- <laughs> I said Campbell the same thing. <laughs> I said the same thing, JB. I said the same thing. <laughs> well, well, if I would have known that you- I, If I would have known you were gonna be on, I would have been in tuxedo. <laughs> This is awesome. Anthony and Michelle, so uh, would, you, would you introduce me to the other gentleman as well? Yes. So this is John Cohen, who's the owner of um, NASCAR team from New York Racing. It's called New York Racing. But he's a yes. team owner. So our conversations every week are done by um, John and Anthony. And then I just sit in here and make sure the technology works and keep the show going. <laughs> That's like my only job. So that. So John, very nice meeting you, sir, which Anthony and Michelle basically are indicating to me, I'm gonna to have to go to a corporate, uh, some corporate titans and some of the NBA friends to put together enough money to maybe create a team out of Washington, uh, DC. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure to you too. Absolutely. So but James, uh, JB, thank you so much for coming on. Like, this is such a special treat, um, you know, for the children, for Ed, for Jim Campbell, for all of us, for you to come in. Did you have any particular question for Ed? Well, first of all, I used uh, Ed as an example because so many of us are lovers of cars. And um, Anthony has been Mr. Campbell's biggest PR agent and that which really has attracted me to this, Anthony and Michelle, clearly is your commitment to young people. Uh, I've been blessed through a number of uh, experiences like the three of your guests here uh, to be in some pretty significant circles, but it's always about taking the lessons back to our young people so they can broaden their horizons and aspire to see a collection of diverse, successful people working together in a team-oriented fashion to accomplish a goal that everybody has. So that's my, uh, that's my passion. And Anthony was telling me, of course, look, Ed Welburn, I've watched his renderings. I'll tell you the story later about how when Mark Lanave and Mike Jackson were there, they blessed mm -hmm. me to get a ZR1 when it came off the line in 09. And let me finish it. So I, I sneaked it at home. I had a 69 Camaro in the garage under a car cover. And my wife didn't know I had gotten a ZR1, so I sneaked it in the garage. And one day we came home and she looked over and she says, has the Camaro shrunk a little bit? It looks to be a little lower. And I said, no, 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 don't worry about it, sweetheart. It's all good. So two weeks after NFL travels, I realized I hadn't started the car up. So I closed the garage door, went in the car and tried to crank it. And you know, you push the button and I heard it very weak. Well, I'm thinking old school technology closed the door so as not to drain any energy from the battery. I closed the door, pushed the uh, button, and it's dead. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I hadn't read the owner's manual. After 10 minutes of sitting in there and figuring out I'm gonna have to break a window, I broke the driver's side glass, crawled out of there. My wife came in the garage, what is going on? I said, sweetheart, I got stuck in a car. Whose car is that? I said, don't worry about it. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> I called the dealership to explain to them. Come and get my Corvette. And he says, why? 
I said, because I had to break the glass because the battery was dead. She said, well, why didn't you reach the latch by your, by your leg and just pop the door open? So the lesson for me to tell young people is read the owner's manual, not only with cars, but in the game of life. So <laughs> that's right. That's right. Only life came with the owner owner's manual, right? <laughs> um, but I, I did fail to mention um, Ed and Jim and John is that uh, JB for I think since two thousand and nine has been our moderator for our what it takes program. And what it takes is when we get a bunch of when we first started. It was just for boys, um, just get a bunch of young men to kind of get them together to have this conversation about we sparking their interest in their academic careers. Um, and we've hosted so many people and JB has moderated these conversations. We had Charles Barkley, Stephen A. Smith, um, you name it, like it's ran the gamut from A to Z, from businessmen, actors, celebrities, athletes, um, it doesn't matter, everybody in between. So James, I definitely want to thank you for always moderating those because they become extra special when JB moderates them. So, so like a Jim, so, so, go ahead, James. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, okay, so, Anthony, I was going to say, um, Michelle did team me up. So let me, I'll ask one question of each. And, and again, obviously these very successful colleagues of yours have a heart for kids as well too. And that truly is what it's all about. My mother and father, God bless them, were high school graduates, but I like to say they had PhDs in determination to send us to school. Um, trust me, I would never have been blessed to go to a school like Harvard uh, without my mother saying that excellence is embedded in each and every one of us, no matter your background. So if I could start with Mr. Campbell, I know Ed said, call him Ed, so Jim, let me understand what what's been your passion in working with the young people uh, with Michelle and Anthony as well. Yeah, uh, JB. First of all, thanks for what you're doing with the school over the years, and uh, we share uh, an amazing passion. I know Ed does as well, and he's been very involved uh, for creating uh, support around the school that combines this combination of the excitement and passion of racing with uh, the fundamentals of the STEM principles. And I, we love that combination because learning can be fun. And when it's fun, I think we, we all accomplish more. Um, and also what I would say, and there's, a, there's almost 20 students out here today and we've had a chance to go to the award ceremony and there's just literally you know, a couple hundred there with their families. It's so exciting to, to see them recognized for their accomplishments, both in the classroom and on the track. And, um, and I'm also very inspired by the students who have graduated and taken part in the uh, Urban Youth Racing School and come back to share their stories of their experience at the school and then what they've accomplished since they've left the school. And it's very inspiring to hear those stories. And so I love that combination. And, and uh, thank you again for what you've done for the school. Absolutely. So John, you mentioned, uh, Jim, you mentioned about uh, fun and being able to turn that into something which certainly if that's at the core of what you're doing, your passion, you'll never work a job. So John, how did you translate that into pursuing what you're doing now? And is it still fun? Um, well, traditionally growing up, I grew up in North New Jersey. So racing, the only racing we did was street racing. So like what I'm doing now is definitely a lot of fun is is something I have a passion for. Like I tell anybody, if you're doing something and you break up with a person and you don't love that business the way you love that person on the breakup, you're doing, and you're in the wrong business. Like you have to love what you do. And I'm trying to get kids that's from the inner city that grew up the way I, you know I grew up, not knowing racing into racing because I feel like a lot of kids love cars. They love to go fast, and I just think they don't have the opportunity to see it, especially in areas that's not have seen racing or have not been affected like school, like the urban racing school have in, in other cities. So I, my goal is to make sure that every kid in America knows about the school and have an outlet to go into racing. And I'm certainly committed to that as well too, uh, John, with respect to the platform that each of us has is a significant one. And I wanna make sure I give some exposure today to what um, Anthony and Michelle have been doing and to your point about kids growing up in whatever environment it is, I go to, again, it's hard to say Ed as opposed to Mr. Welburn. That's just, I can hear my mother in my head right now. But, uh, 
but I firmly believe that God has placed excellence and a talent in each and every person on this earth. And for a kid to dream to be at a significant level like you have been with an organization like uh, GM, what was key for you, Ed, to be able to rise to the level that you've been with your skills? You know, I, I have immediately, I think of my parents and the support that I received mm. from them and the support that I received from others. You know, I, my parents just did everything they could to support me, to guide me um, along the way. And, and they had very different backgrounds, my mother and father from each other. And right before I started work at General Motors, I uh, asked for counsel with Leon Sullivan, Reverend Leon Sullivan. And we sat and talked mm -hmm. one afternoon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he kind of, it's like I've, I'd been on this mission. I was pushing, going through a lot. And there it was. I was ready to go to General Motors. And he kind of gave me that last push, that last bit of energy I needed to, to make that step into GM. And, and I'll never forget that. Never forget that. And I feel mm. as though, you know, well, and today, I tell you, and I think of, go ahead. No, no, but please go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'm no, on no, the, sir, uh, I'm on the board of a design school in Detroit, CCS. And, you know, when I look at GM and I look at the other auto companies and I look at their diversity initiatives, it really means, I mean, you've got to have diversity in the design schools in order to get it in the, auto companies. And to get it within the design schools, you've really got to support initiatives like this particular one. You know, the urban youth, the team, the, the school is just, I think it is the springboard. It is really that foundation that a young person needs to move on in design or in engineering and then move on into uh, one of the great companies of this industry. Hey, Ed, and if I could co-tell on what you just said, and obviously the reason that we're all here being Anthony and Michelle, that diversity that you've talked about, and certainly I've done that, pushing that message on a number of platforms, um, that there's nothing wrong 200 years ago when I was in corporate America working for Xerox <laughs> and then Eastman Kodak, the point was, when we look at people to see the diversity, we should not be hung up on thinking that those differences are um, disadvantageous. We are so much better for the gifts and yeah. strengths that we bring to together, bring to the table as a team, because it reflects that input, including the fact that it's not lost on me that Anthony dragged Michelle into this arena <laughs> and now she's more rabid about it than he is, but that's a blessing for all of us and I've already, look, I've already told Anthony and Michelle that um, because Mark LeNave is over at Ford, I said, no, 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 I am a GM guy. So I'm going to be right up front and tell Mr. Campbell, Mr. Wellburn, I want to do more work with you, with you guys, but all for the purpose of benefiting these kids. And I thank you so very much. And Michelle, even though I'm ad living on my feet here, I hope I did you and Anthony justice in terms of working with these three outstanding representatives. Oh, absolutely, mm -hmm. JB. Thank you so much for coming you, on. Man. It's been great to see you. I haven't seen you in forever, like under this quarantine. You know, it's different. I hadn't seen you before, but to not see people because we're forced, we can't see you. Like, I can't touch you. I can't hug you. I can't, you know, if Jim comes to town. And it was so funny because um, right as the pandemic hit, Jim Campbell was coming in um, yep. and we were doing our last class before we went on track. So it was going to be like the opportunity to hug Jim because I just love Jim to death. <laughs> all of that just kind of got just, you know, it, it's just been insane. So which made us, you know, me and Anthony thought about it, thought about it. We thought about the fact that um, a lot of kids don't have access to computers at home um, at, that, at that time. So it was kind of hard to transition the classes. But then when the school districts went in and were kind of forced to make sure that every child had a computer, I said, that's our opportunity because mm. everybody's going to have access. And you know what? Hey, Michelle, and, uh, and I'm sure uh, Jim Campbell and, uh, and Ed Welburn may well know 
uh, Ken Chenault, who's a good friend and um, um, a, a very good friend, for, uh, recently the chairman and CEO of American Express, who's got such a giving heart as well. And he wanted to narrow that digital divide by ensuring uh, that you know every kid, just like John talked about, who's got that dream, but as opposed to thinking them, having them think that they can't aspire to the same levels or that God isn't giving them a talent that's gonna make all of us better, be meaningful members contributing to society. I pray that we'll be able to do that because in this new normal, we have to know that we should gauge technology to still include everybody to get the best uh, out of everybody because everybody is given some gift that can contribute to the whole. So, hey, Anthony, I need to give you the last word uh, before I say goodbye and go and see if I can find a sport jacket like Ed, Ed Welburn has on so I can look better today. <laughs> well, well, well <laughs> that, by the way, that is a nice sport jacket you have on too, Ed. But, um, but Jay, yeah. thank you very much for, for popping in and saying hello to everyone. And, um, you know, we, we, we love JB. JB's like family. Too. He's like a family member to us also. So thank you again. I'm sure all the kids um, want to thank you for coming on too. And JB, we look forward to talking to you real soon. And, and um, I know you're a big, a big car guy, big Chevy guy. So Jim and Ed, you know, uh, JB is a huge Chevy guy. So he, he wants to work with us also too. So let's make I it know. happen. I know. I know. I've, I've seen pictures of him with that 69 Camaro. Do you still have that Camaro? <laughs> <laughs> you know what, Ed, I am pained to say, I tell a lie, a young guy had been following this one Camaro of mine, I was blessed to have four at the time that was in car shows and winning awards. He caught me on a weak moment and I exchanged that because I was told by my mechanic, the worst thing you can do is not drive the car. I rue the day I did that. So I'm in the market <laughs> looking now, which is why this is a Talking to you and Jim Campbell, I'm going to get something. You guys just figure out if there's any added value I can bring to what you're doing because I want to get a Z, I want to get a, a new vet and I want to get a new truck because Anthony and Michelle had a 2002 Dually Silverado. I've right. got an 05 that's only got 50,000, but I love it. And then maybe John will consider letting me go around as a pace car, you know, before they get started on the racetrack. But thank you guys very much. And love you very much. Love Thank you. Thank you, you. Great to see you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, JB. Appreciate it, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, JB. Uh, guys in person and especially the kids in person, yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, JB, because I was talking um, April 20th, once again, when the pandemic hit, we were supposed to do a What It Takes, um, and it was going to be a huge one. We were preparing. Mm -hmm. The entire school district was behind us. It was going to be at the historical Met here in Philly, which just reopened up and literally had, before it closed down, Madonna, I think, was the last person to perform there. So I'm trying to find a way. I'm going to bring it digital. So we're going to do the what it takes. We're going to do it digital. I have to kind of figure it all out, see what that's going to look like, you know, see what partners we'll bring in. But I think that even though, you know, we can't be physically in the same space, the next best thing is to kind of get everybody here. But, you know, the most important thing about the what it takes is the, the words that these students hear, the encouragement, you know, how to um, reignite their academic careers, how to do certain things. And this is like barbershop talk for men and it's just all men and I love it. Not that there's no women included in the ones we used to, but, you know, let's get real. Boys need to talk to men, right? And it was just a great conversation. So, um, JB, um, I'll definitely hit you up again so that way we can try to figure it out. Now, hey, hey JB, you know I was going to pick you up in that new Corvette. Jim Campbell would arrange it for me to pick you up from the train station for the event that day. Remember that? That's right. <laughs> hey, so. Jump in that Corvette hey. and, uh, thing, and all of a sudden the, the world changed on us for a bit. <laughs> Because hey, hey, well, Jim, Jim, hey, Ed and John, uh, Anthony, Anthony used the word politely that he had arranged for Jim. He twisted Jim's arm <laughs> to make sure that he could come pick me up in the Corvette. I actually had to pick up Ed and John because let's put it this way: um, there was some extra winter weight on. I'm down about forty pounds, so I'll gladly take you up on riding that Corvette when we come here. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Okay, God. Love you, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank have you. a great day. All right. Love you, JB. Okay. Hey. Yes, sir. All right. Let's get back to Ed. So now, um, and you're gonna um take us on a quick a quick tour of your um of your office space. We'll t we'll take a quick tour. Yep. And uh, who? Uh, uh, where did Ed go? I, I have two real important pop culture questions for Ed. When he, when. All right. We got to come back in. I see kids have questions too. Ah, uh, there he is. All yeah. right, Ed. Awesome. Okay, we're gonna take a quick walk and then uh, we'll continue with the conversation. Yes, because who else has two cars in their office? In their like house. Not one. I can barely fit a car in any room in my house, but he can fit two cars. In his office, in his house. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> well, there are a number of things, you know, this, this engine that's here, this small block. I just thought it'd be cool to have a cool Corvette engine in the office. So I built this a couple uh, winters ago with the cross ram manifold and all. The 57 Corvette is one that uh, I uh, purchased a couple years ago. This Corvette Z06 is very special to me. Right before I retired from GM, I uh, drove it in his house, y'all. <laughs> An entire Corvette. I shipped it to. I shipped this car to Rome, and did a photo shoot at the Colosseum. Then drove up through Italy, Tuscany, and Milan. Stopped at Monza, and drove. They let me drive a few laps of the track. Then on to Torino, where I spent time with students of design there. Then on to uh, Le Mans. Uh, for the 24 hour race and then to Versailles, picked up my wife in Paris and we went to, to Reims to her uh, favorite champagne company, Vu, and then uh, on to Goodwood for the Festival of Speed. Maybe if I take over the camera, we can, uh, we'll just quickly go through, you see that tail lamp up there at the top of the bookshelf? Mm -hmm. That's the very first thing that I designed when I was at GM. I mean, they gave the rookie all the small jobs, and I just designed that for, I think it was a 75 Pontiac. And then he just on through the bookshelves. The car, the 57 Corvette, it's license plate, Mr. Earl. It's kind of a tribute to Harley Earl, who was the first head of design and his team designed this car. It's one of my absolute favorite Corvettes. Uh, great design, very clean design, which is a big deal to me. Uh, this is also a big deal to me, this award that I received from hmm. you guys. And then the there's- The uh, Racing School, that's right. Yes. And then uh, a model of the Chaparral 2X. Jim? I, I have Jim Campbell to thank for this driving suit. This is from uh, the year that I went to Le Mans with him. Next to it is a driving suit that I had made when Jim Hall uh, invited me to drive one of the chaparrales. This is me in the chaparral. I've actually driven two chaparrales. And then it's just more things from from my years That's and we'll go back amazing. back over here and we'll have a seat and if you can uh switch it back maybe i should go over to my desk so we can talk about charlie wiggins yes that was where i was about to head into okay um, but we do have a couple, well, we'll do this conversation and then I have kids who have their hands up that are um, waiting to come in and ask some questions. But we do want to get into this conversation about the Golden Glory sweepstakes, which is yes. really awesome. And, you know, the racing school has been teaching it since pretty much our inception. Um, Anthony was in GQ magazine talking about it. 
we at one point, Anthony and I and Hill Harper owned the rights to the book, which you now own the rights to, and you're doing this fantastic movie. So congratulations, um, because that is not an easy feat, you guys. Uh, to do the Golden Glory, it was a timepiece. It's from 1924 to 1936. So everything about doing that movie is expensive, right? Everything about it. But if you can just tell us a little bit more about why you decided to do it um, and show us some of, because I know you have some sketches on what you're doing and we would love to see that. Yeah, you know, it was, it's interesting. Uh, 2006, I was at the Indy 500. I've been a fan of the 500 since I was a little kid. Uh, Colin Powell was driving the pace car. I had the opportunity to drive one of the other Corvette parade cars for the start of the race. You know, we take a couple laps of the track and then we peel off and Colin Powell has charge of the rest of the car. So that was a huge thrill for me to drive one of those cars for the start of the Indy 500. At the end of the race, go back to the hotel, quick change to go to the after parties, flip on the TV and it just happened to be on PBS. And it just happened to be starting to show the documentary for Golden Glory. And I had never heard about this and I never heard the story. And I was so drawn into it that I was late for the, the parties after. But you know, when you watch PBS, not only do you, you get great entertainment, but at the end, you know, they sell you the DVD and the book. I bought both. Right. And over the years, I probably watched that documentary 10 times and read the book two or three times. And after I retired from GM, you know, I kept thinking somebody needs to make a movie about this. Somebody needs to do that. And a good friend of ours was spending some time with us and she's a producer in Hollywood and her name's Madison Lee. And uh, she watched the documentary with me and I said, somebody needs to make a movie, you know? And so she said, yeah, you're absolutely right. And it's you. You need to be the executive producer. You should do it. She, was a, she wanted to be a part of it. And we've put together a phenomenal team of writers and producers and advisors. Uh, I formed Wellburn Media Productions and uh, we're off and running. And uh, that's about all that I can talk about so far because you know a lot of it's confidential that industry is as confidential as the auto industry but uh i'm very excited i this may be one of the if not the most meaningful thing i've ever worked on it's awful close to it uh, nice. i would like to show you a little bit of you know because everyone asked me why did charlie win so many races so many championships and i have gotten so into Charlie Wiggins and have analyzed the few photos that there are of his cars mm -hmm. and using the same technology that he used to draw do his drawings because he did a lot of drawings I've kind of traced how his cars have evolved and I want to share that with you Awesome. While you're doing that's that, okay. while you're getting your camera ready, I do have an audience uh, going on over on Facebook Live. So welcome, you guys. Um, and we're talking about right now, before we get into the questions with the students, we're talking about the Golden Glory um, sweepstakes. Um, what a lot of people don't know is from 1924 to 1936 that African Americans had their own racing league, the same way that there was a, a you know, the... Um, the racing league of, I mean, I'm sorry, the- uh, The league of baseball. Yeah, major, uh, the- You got it. Baseball and different things like that. There were, uh, there was a league for just black folks to race because they were not allowed to race back then. Once again, this is 1924 through 1936. And the gentleman that Ed is speaking about, um, he was actually known, he was the um, best driver, but he was actually known as the Negro Speed King. Um, yeah. And not only that, his wife was probably a better mechanic than he was. Yeah, she was a she was definitely a great um, great mechanic and and she was a great driver too. She yeah. did a lot of the test driving. Oh, okay. I mean, I, I want to say something real fast. One of the reasons why, and this is Jim Campbell too. 
one of the reasons why we've been teaching about the golden glory for all these years is we felt it was very important for urban kids and African-American kids to understand that they, that they do have a history in racing. A lot of inner city kids, they just don't believe that racing is so far, um, they're so far um, from racing that they don't feel like they have an attachment to it or any type of connection with it. But in 1924, um, this guy, William, his name was William Rucker, they called him Prez. He was the founder of the Golden Glory Sweet States and the Color Speedway Association. Um, wanted to give African-American drivers and, and mechanics an opportunity to be a part of the sport. This is how he actually formed it. So it was really more like the old, old Negro Leagues of Baseball. But one of the reasons why we've been teaching it at the racing school for all these years is we want these kids to do know that they do have a history in the motorsports industry that they do have some type of connection to it. And one of the things that I, we actually do in our curriculum is the fact that they have to study and know about these different folks. Like, uh, as Michelle mentioned, um, Charlie Wiggins, the Negro Speed King, um, William Rucker, um, the founder of the Golden Glory Sweepstakes, and um, other drivers who participated in the Golden Glory Sweepstakes. So, and these are questions that we ask on tests to Jim, so everything that they learn one week and the following week, they actually get tested on. So a lot of the kids that have gone through our program over the 22 years know about the Golden Glory Sweepstakes. And the, uh, the races they ran were very well attended. They were actually festivals. And, yes. and you know, the latter half of the time in which they existed was during the Depression. And other That's forms right. of racing went away. And this was one of the few that was able to still exist during that period of time. Absolutely. So at any rate, you know, so I've been tracing the history of the Wiggins space special and have diagrammed it here. And over time, over a period from 1928 through 34, 35, his car, and Jim, you, you'll appreciate this. If you can imagine, to lower the chassis three inches to the ground over the original car to the later car, to lower it three inches, bring the engine down three inches, the driver compartment, the fuel tank down three inches, really helps, I mean, you know, the, the center of gravity. And then to bring the, the hood down even more, it came down a total of five inches from the original car. He just, the car evolved from this very stand up, vehicle to one that was much lower to the ground and had a, the original one just had a radiator in the front to something that had more of a, a fairing on the front of it. And this is the type of radiator shell that he put over the actual radiator. I'm sure it helped aerodynamics, but it also gave it more protection from the rocks and stones that were being kicked up from the dirt track. But right. all of these drawings that I've done, I've done a whole series of them, are done with the same kind of materials that he would have used to do his drawings. And same technology, same kind of sweeps and very, very basic tools to and create. With you had, um, you know, your point around um, getting the lower center of gravity and then some aerodynamic benefit uh, meant as much then as it does today. And so that's, uh, that's great. Yeah, to yeah. Well, the other advantage he had, I mean, these weren't very high horsepower cars at the time. The fact that he was a small guy, he weighed a hundred pounds less than his chief rival, which had to have really helped him a lot on a dirt right. track. So, yeah. Lower mass. I like I'm going to promote one of our students to panelists. You can continue talking, Ed. I'm going to promote Avant. Walker up. Elijah, you're very welcome to come up if you want. And remember, you guys, if you, you think I should come, come back on, to... use the Q&A button so I can see your okay. questions. But I'll, I'll read what Elijah says. So Elijah said, Josh Gibson was one of the people in the Negro League. He was better than Babe Ruth, but he was 36 when he died. He was in Baseball Hall of Fame. I learned this at a Juneteenth event in Pittsburgh. I need you to learn some Golden Glory stuff, all right? Um, all right. Hey, Avant, how are you, hon? Hello, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Go ahead. You can ask your question, baby. Okay. So I was wondering, like, 
the design, like how I know it's a very long, difficult process, like in NASCAR, NASCAR <laughs> Cup Series, the Chevrolet Camaro, we had like tracks last year at tracks at like Daytona, Talladega, the nose was a little too pointy. So Chevy had to go back and change the front nose and flatten it out. And I was wondering, like, how do y'all think of like everything that you got to go through with the design process, even in street cars? Like, I have a, a I have a 1999 Toyota Corolla, and I know that recently, like last week, my muffler came off. I had to get that fixed, and when I was, and I know with my Toyota, I can feel the rule. So when my car was in the shop, I had to drive my brother car. He has a 2012 Buick LaCrosse, and it was smoother. I could still feel the rule a little bit, but it was smoother. <laughs> I was wondering, like, how do y'all? Where's that kinking process for y'all? And like when you're you know, when you're kinking that process, are you, like, how do y'all put in the idea of both regular people and people who like racing to drive cars for, for when you put them in? Like, how do y'all put that both together? Hey, do you want to start? Yeah, I'll start. I mean, it is a great question. Um, you know, when I, I think about the development of car, every car is different. And, and their customers are different. And the very first thing that a designer and an engineer need to understand up front is what is the mission for that car? Who is the customer? You know, is this a customer that their priority is a nice boulevard ride? Or is this a customer who wants performance and maybe they're gonna take it to the track on weekends? And understanding that up front then it's a lot easier to develop the vehicle. Uh, some cars have a great balance between boulevard ride and performance ride. Others skew more towards the boulevard, others more to track. Uh, some cars, my Corvette, you know, you can dial it in, you know, to uh, different per performance characteristics and that all has an influence. And so, you know, you've got to make a decision on, on what it is that you're developing. What is the mission for that car? And I think Jim could probably speak to it at, at yeah. length. Yeah, I, mean, I, th I think you captured uh, the main idea is where it really depends on uh, the, the customer that you're, you're, you're focused on and what are their, what are their needs? What, are their, what do they want? What are the attributes that they want? And uh, we do a lot of research where they'll tell you very directly what they want. But we also have to be very uh, observant and, and listen to what they're saying and maybe what they're not saying as we yeah. then make the right yeah. priorities in, in the development of the vehicle from a design and engineering standpoint. So it's really a combination of those things. And one thing I might add, because we talked a little bit about you met your question a little bit about, uh, in that case, NASCAR Cup. But one thing that is really uh, quite important is we have, uh, and Ed was a key part of this uh, uh, team, is that when we prepare to go racing on the track, um, Corvette racing is a great example, but every vehicle we race is a similar thing. There's a partnership between design, between the vehicle engineering team, between our, our propulsion or our powertrain team, our race team, uh, and, and, and to, to really develop a race car that can compete at the highest levels on the track. And that, uh, that partnership, and Ed talked about it uh, from a design perspective, a partnership with engineering, the same goes true when we prepare to go racing on the track. And if we do it right, we can preserve an amazing design and an incredible, absolutely incredible performance on the track. And that's a combination that we want. Uh, and Ed and I were talking earlier before the class started, the other thing's quite unique about uh, vehicle programs like Corvette where we raced, we have an amazing connection to our customers. Uh, and uh, they, they give us feedback on what they love and what they don't love and that we take that into account every time we do a new production car or a new race car. And so uh, that's a little bit of the insight on, on the way we think about it. It, it even wow. gets down to the tires. I mean, the tires have such a major influence on the handling and the ride that the car has. Wow, thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Thank you. Thanks for the question. All right, if anybody else wants to come up, just raise your hand, but we will, hold on, change him back to attendee. Okay. All right, so Ed, while we continue, or while we wait for others to raise their hand, I do have um, 
some questions for you, or not questions, kind of like, you know, what are you doing now? And I know you don't like the word retirement because I don't feel like you have actually retired, right? So I just want to read something because when people, you know, fully retire, you don't continue, well, you may, but to receive the type of awards that you have, right? So this is after retirement, you guys. So after retirement, um, Ed is in the automotive, now in the Automotive Hall of Fame. He received the Eyes on Design Lifetime Achievement Award. He got an honorary um, doctorate college for creative studies and the first car designer to have their archives placed in the Smithsonian. Wow, that is so dope. <laughs> oh my God, that is, that's so awesome. But there's also, you know, some things that you're working on. I know you're working on your book. You're, of course, working on a movie. You're working on your book, which is probably your biggest project in life. But one thing that you're doing that I find extremely impressive is that you are the chief design advisor for Bolt Mobility um, Corporation. And as you wrote, yes, that is Usain Bolt. Yes. That's yes. amazing. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Um, you know, it's one of the uh, scooters that that is a rental scooter that, you know, many cities, many urban areas have these days. Theirs in particular, I think, is very cool. And it's an existing, they designed the scooter before I got involved. And, you know, I was brought on to take the scooter to the next level to explore other opportunities with uh, scooters and other types of scooters even. I just, it's just, it's, it's a cool scooter and they're a great group of very creative people that I'm working with. And I look forward to seeing some very innovative things happen with, with, these are electric scooters, by the way. Yes, and if you ever need anybody to test it, I'm here, <laughs> I'm like all the way here, okay? I'm here. They're cool, but, they're very cool. Absolutely, we have Elijah, all right, Elijah, go ahead, babe. What's your question? Um, so how many designs do you think you've done and what is your favorite out of all of them? Wow. You know, I'm told that I was involved in the design of over, I think it's 540 cars and trucks. Uh, that, that's what, you know, they, they say I've worked on. It's probably a bit more than that. Uh, my favorite ones, you know, it, it's funny because it's easy to say the latest Corvette. Um, and that is one of my favorites. Uh, designing, bringing Camaro back was uh, very important. It was exciting. And when we showed the concept vehicle, the excitement that there was, and it was Bumblebee in a movie. And in the first movie that it was in, everyone cheered when the car appeared, it came out of that tunnel in that Transformer movie. But also there have been a couple small cars that our team developed for India and for other areas around the world that really made a difference. When you think of, you know, that because a family that may have had a two wheeler was now able to get this very affordable small car and it just kind of changed their world in some ways. So, those are some of the most important cars. Uh, our team designed the beast for the president. And that was- I was about to say that. Yeah, that was one of my questions about that. In, in fact, I, yeah. I, wrote in it, I wrote in it before Obama did. <laughs> it was, the, the car is amazing. It's an amazing car, what it can do. That was mind blowing, um, Ed. Thank you so much, Elijah. I'm about to, thank you, babe. I'm about to um, bring up Tay. Tay, you're up next. And uh, let me see, Tay has her hand up. I'm bringing you up. All right. So when I saw that, because it was, I don't know who did it. It may have been Essence. I don't remember who did it, but I saw this spread and it was like Obama walking around the car. And I guess you were explaining all the features and everything. And I was like, that is so cool. I know that guy. He's signing <laughs> cards for the president. <laughs> Hi, Tay. Hi. Why did Hi. you write a letter to General Motors when you were 11? I did that because, uh, 
you know, I, I was passionate about cars and about designing cars. And I wanted information about careers in design. What does it take? What did I need to study? What did I have to do to become a professional designer? And this is that I was age 11. And, you know, it's like, do I need to focus on math? Do I need to focus on science, on art? To be honest with you, it's all of them. But uh, it was important at that point in my life to do that. And it really, they sent me great information and I've just followed their lead. Does that answer your question, Tay? All right, thank you so okay, much. Thank, thank you for that question. All right, we have, let me um, bring her down. All right, so we have a question from this gentleman here. What's going on, man? Good morning, yeah. everybody. Hello. I wanted to, you know, thank you uh, just because you are a Howard graduate, I am as well, so HU. Um, and my question for you was, uh, what was the first car that you ever rode or owned that you designed? Oh that I owned, that I designed. First car you ever drove in that you designed. Oh. That's equivalent to like a rapper or an artist hearing their music on the radio for the first time. While yeah, it, it, it is, you know, it's, it's one thing to drive a car that, that you worked on. I gotta tell you though, I, what comes to mind immediately is seeing a family, you know, driving down the street in a car that you designed or just sitting at a traffic light and everybody in the car, they got big smiles on their faces. They're happy, <laughs> they're going, who knows where they're off to, but you know, and they're driving a car that you designed. That is so cool. That, that for me is more rewarding than driving one myself. Just Can you remember, and do you think you could remember any of the time or the first time you ever seen that though? Cause I know that feeling probably was, un, you know, old. Yeah, I, I, I remember sitting at a traffic light in Detroit and this Cutlass pulled up next to me and the family was in there and they're all happy. And I look over, you know, at first I'm looking because it was the car that I had designed. It's the first one I'd seen on the street. I'd seen them at the proving grounds, the first one I'd seen on the street. And then I looked and I could see the family in there, how happy they were. And then, you know, when the light turned green, I let them pull off first and I just, it was just kind of cool. Wow. I'll never forget that moment. You can only imagine. Wow. Oh, my, my last, my last uh, you know, I actually wanted to say something. Or, uh, how do you feel about, um, I don't know if you understand, but you, the cars that you design are extremely, I would say extremely prominent in the hip hop community. So you have, you have designed cars that are, um, how, do, how do I say, they're like, legendary bars, right? Like you got Scarface, you got Jay-Z, you got these different artists that use some of your cars as, you know, their bikes. Yeah, and their lyrics. So how does that make you feel? Because you're in movies, you're, I mean, just your ideas are in movies, they're in rap songs, they're in all kinds of stuff. Like, did you, could you imagine that when you were 11 writing GM, uh, wanting to No, get no, no, I never, I never thought about it. I. You know, I, oh, I, went, I was so, such tunnel vision to design cars. I never thought about uh, the celebrity side of it or people, you know, putting it into songs and all. I, I'll never forget a special event that Shaq had in LA. Uh, he took over one of the film sets. It was like a street scene and he had a block party. <laughs> at this, and we had this, we had people going through the crowd from GM and it's full of celebrities, a lot of very cool people. And they were handing out these little silver cards that said, the general would like to see you in stage 23. And they'd look at it and they'd go to stage 23. And then this closed off stage 23 was me and the next generation of Escalade and they had never seen it before. Wow. And, <laughs> And the funny thing is, you know, some of them I recognized, some of them I didn't at all, you know, the celebrities that came in, but it was fun to just get their reaction to the car. This is before we showed it to the public at all, uh, to get their reaction. And, you know, it, it, I, I just love the interaction between 
the public, whether it's a celebrity or, you know, just the buying public uh, and the vehicles that you design. That's it's awesome. just, it's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, that question posed because when you said the Cutlass, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with an artist by the name of Nipsey Hussle, but uh, yeah. his favorite record of mine is a song called Summertime and that Cutlass. If you never <laughs> heard it, you should totally check it out. But I'm like, to, to know that you, your design inspired a whole sound and you wouldn't even think about that. You know what I'm saying? That's crazy. Yeah. So yeah. Congrats yeah. on thank that. You. you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna thank check you. It out, but thank you for answering my questions. Howard, Howard, uh, Howard. Thank you. Yes. Cool. Jim, I want to flip that question to you, though, because, you know, as the head of Team Chevy and working with Chevrolet for so long, how do you feel when you see your cars on the street, right? And you're just going, it's like, oh, wow, that's a new car that just came out, something that Ed designed or maybe another designer. How does that feel for you? Uh, it, fe it feels great. And, and the one thing that is, and Ed has indicated this a couple of times as well, there's such an amount, amazing amount of teamwork that has to has to take place to, to actually envision a vehicle and then and then really develop it along the way to the point where it actually does debut and we do produce vehicles that are are going to the dealerships around the country and are sold to customers and we see them on the road and on the racetrack on occasion on the weekends and so it, it's a it's a proud moment. Uh, cars are are complex machines, over thirty thousand parts. And so it just, it takes an amazing team from different disciplines working together as one. And as Ed kind of had uh, indicated, sometimes we have a little tension that's, that's good healthy tension about, um, you know, kind of decisions we want to make and what does that mean for the vehicle and, and, and how will that impact the customer? Uh, it's a very proud thing. I'm also, I also love to see our race cars on the track on the weekends. Uh, we race, you know, pretty much from, uh, kind of the end of January all the way to almost Thanksgiving. On most weekends, we're racing somewhere around the world. And to see our, our products uh, and the race teams compete at such a high level uh, for to win uh, races and, and drive towards championships, when you get a race win, it's so difficult to win on the track. Uh, and uh, when you get it, it's a moment to celebrate, but not for long because in seven days we'll be racing again. So we have to prepare for the next race. And for the Urban Youth Racing School, you know, there's a lot of classroom uh, activity taking place, but there will be a moment when you get back on track and uh, every week, whether you win or not, there's something to learn that you take forward to the next race. And my, my other question- People, uh, On the car development side and racing side. My other question for you, Jim, and probably for you too, John, is that, um, and I think this is uh, actually kind of major because NASCAR is the first sport to kind of come back online um, since the pandemic. Of course, they're racing with no fans and I know that they're taking a lot of precautions, but at least you get to have your cars kind of back on the track and everybody watching these races. As Miles Bird pointed out in the chat that NASCAR racing is on NBC Sunday, you all should check it out. <laughs> yeah, that's great. John, you wanna take that one? Um, it, it means a lot, especially when uh, there's no content on TV. So most of the fans actually now can actually watch, you know, watch racing and people that never watched racing before can enjoy racing. Mm -hmm. I get a lot of texts now like, oh, NASCAR's on. I never watched it before. It's pretty cool. Like it's just so it, it brings more of a, for, a forefront to NASCAR, you know, to a lot of people that never seen it before. And also um, it's just showing that, you know, like. NASCAR, you know, is, is, is trying to set a trend that, you know, all sports can go back out there now without fans. And as we go along and, and things get better, then fans can come back into the stadiums. So it's, it's, it's only a good thing right now that what NASCAR is doing. Yeah. I, and I, I would add, uh, I totally agree with John. I mean, there's just such a, a thirst and hunger for real live sports and it's happening. Uh, NASCAR is one of the first to go back uh, in Darlington for two races this weekend. They'll be in Charlotte and they'll do another race at Charlotte during midweek. Uh, so it's so exciting to be back on this weekend. Also on Sunday, uh, IndyCar is going to do a rebroadcast of the 2019 IndyCar or Indy 500 race in which uh, Simon Pagano and Alexander Rossi raced right to the end, wheel to wheel. Uh, Simon won the race uh, with some Chevy power, which we love. But what's going to be exciting is they actually brought those two drivers back and they actually are, are, uh, did commentary about the race. So they're watching the race together. And so it's going to be very exciting to hear what they think about watching the race from a year ago. 
And then before uh, long in June at Texas, we'll be racing an IndyCar again. Uh, I know the IMSA, which is sports car racing. Uh, we race both the Corvette and the GTLM class. And we race the Cadillacs and the DPI or the prototype classes. They'll be back uh, here a little bit later this summer. And of course, NHRA drag racing will be back later this summer as well. So really excited to see us back on track. I have a question that that Corvette for IMSA is it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Did you design that? Ed? Um, yeah, I you know I did. I was there for the development of the design of C8. You're speaking of, and uh, the design from a design perspective was about complete when I left. In fact, on my very last day there, I. I had a review of the design. They were still working on the rear a bit, but uh, on the most part, it was it was set uh, as a theme. Now there's all there's work right up to the very end that continues, and uh, the studio team was very much involved, both interior and exterior, on the final execution. But yeah, I I feel very connected to that car, both exterior design and interior. Awesome. Now I know, John, you had a couple of pop culture questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, one was about the beast, but uh, two was about Bumblebee. But my question to you, Ed, um, you know, the Camaro was going for so long. Like I had a 69 Camaro, so I, you know, I love yeah. that car. So the Camaro was going for so long. So why bringing, I, I read somewhere that you were the one who bought Chevrolet cars to my, uh, to being one of the transformers. I don't know if that's true or not, but if so, um, when that 72 Camaro was in the tunnel and it, and it changed to the new Camaro, how did you feel knowing that that was the unveiling to the world that uh, the Camaro's back? Was it was, awesome. yeah. You know, uh, we, were, we were looking for a concept vehicle for the Detroit Auto Show. And my leader, uh, Bob Lutz, was saying it needed to be, you know, retro's really in, what is there? that we could do that brings back something. And there were a number of ideas floating around. And I said, let's bring back Camaro. Because, you know, at that time, at Barrett Jackson and at other auction houses, uh, Gen 1 Camaros, particular 69, were selling for a lot of money. And, it, and that was kind of an indicator to me that there was a real people were wanted the car. So we developed the concept vehicle. In parallel, we developed with Michael Bay, Bumblebee. And Michael Bay was looking for something really special to be Bumblebee. We were in a very secret location developing Camaro concept car. Uh, and Chevrolet Marketing wanted me to show him the Camaro that we're working on. I didn't want to do it. You know, I said, I said, well, he needs to tell me about the movie before I show him the car. And he didn't want to tell me about the movie until I showed him the car. I gave in, he told me, I showed him the car, he told me about the movie. And then I, I gotta tell you, uh, I worked fairly closely with Michael on all the Transformer movies from then on out. Uh, placing Camaro in a key role, Corvette was in it, and then a couple other Chevrolets were, were in the, many of the Transformer movies. But when it came out of that tunnel, and the audience cheered. The first time I was in the theater and, and heard that, I couldn't believe it. You know, I thought, well, maybe it's because it's a Detroit audience. But then I saw it in another location. Third time I saw it, I was in Korea in a theater. And when the Camaro came out of that tunnel and everyone cheered, I said, wow, I think we've got something pretty special. Here. Yeah, that was a great, you know, I remember we watched them, um, we were in Vegas and we took our daughters to watch the movie. And that scene was really huge because I remember my youngest one, she's 10 now, but her eyes were all lit up. They were huge um, as she watched the car transform. So yes. you cheered or you kind of stood stuck and just watching it. She was stuck watching it and her eyes were wide open. And it was like, you know, seeing it come from the past into the future, but she didn't really understand the past, right? She didn't yes. understand that that yes. was the first one and now it transformed into this new one, this, what we were so geeked and hyped about. So that's great. Um, I have Xavier on. Xavier, you can come on, babe. I'm going to Hello. start your camera. And you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, okay. My question is, 
my question is for Mr. Ed. Do you think the C8 relates to like any hypercar or supercar right now? Like your, um, Corvette C8? Well, you know, it depends on, on what you consider a hypercar. The fact that it performs with cars that cost three, four times as much. And I think it really holds its own or more than holds its own with those cars. I'm so excited about what uh, Chevrolet is bringing to market with the C8 Corvette. Uh, it's almost like it defies the laws of physics that a car that cool with that kind of interior space and luggage space and performance and quality can be sold at that price point. That is a supercar. That is a supercar. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Xavier, you have any more questions? Um, no, that's it. Thank you. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, um, let me change him back to attendee. So uh, Ed, can you tell us what is in your garage? <laughs> well, uh, well, the 57 Corvette and, and the Z06 Corvette are in my office. Uh, up in the garage is a C4 Corvette, which I really enjoy driving. It's a convertible, very, you know, in some ways, very simple car, trusty car. I have a 69 Camaro uh, that I absolutely love. I've had that car for I don't know, 20 years probably, you know, daily drivers, a Cadillac. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm just crazy about cars. So I know that outside of your design and everything like that, that there are some really cool things that you just like to do. What are other things that you like to do besides design cars? Well, I, I enjoy cooking. I'm not a great cook. My wife is a much better cook than I am. But uh, I enjoy cooking. I enjoy creating. I should put it that way. It's like, it's like I had this very uh, focused, like tunnel vision to design cars all my life. And when I graduated from GM, it's like it just all exploded into many different directions of creativity. I still love designing cars, but I enjoy sketching uh, athletic shoes. I've got tons of sketches of athletic shoes that I've been sketching. Uh, the design work on the scooters, the movie work. Uh, I really, I love music. I love music and creating playlists. I, uh, I'm a kind of a frustrated quest love, I guess. I don't know. You know, I just, I kind of like to be a DJ. I just love a wide variety of music. So there's, there's a little group that I want you to look up and add them to your playlist. They're called The Royal Mix, right? Oh, I think you met them. You saw them. They performed at the um, awards ceremony. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so their music is everywhere, uh, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you can find their stuff. Yeah. Um, I have one more question before we go into our insane lightning round that I told you about. And yeah, this I'm is from um, Daryl Dorsey. And he says to Ed and Jim, what do you prefer, manual transmission or paddle shifters? <sighs> Who's gonna take it first? Uh, I, I, maybe I'll go first. I think, uh... You know, my history is in manual transmissions. And so uh, they're becoming so rare now to be able to drive a manual shifting car is absolutely a thrill. It's really fun to be able to control the transmission yourself, but clearly um, paddle shifting and electronic shifting is uh, the way of the future. And most of our cars uh, today, it, it is electronic shifting through paddles uh, and, and the shifting mechanism is so fast, they can actually be faster than a manual shifting. Uh, it's just, it's, it's, not as, uh, it's not as fun as the old shifter, but it is from a performance standpoint, even faster. And what I'm finding is that a lot of the young up and coming racers, um, they, uh, that's how they've learned through paddle shifting. And so uh, in some cases we've uh, had uh, racers that when they go into NASCAR, for example, and they've got to get into a manual shift mode, we actually have to send a, a Camaro or a Corvette out to them so they can actually learn the sequence of shifting with manual transmission. Uh, but the way of the future is no doubt paddle shifting. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with, with Jim. You know, 
a couple of my older cars have manual 69 Camaro's got a Hearst four speed and, and it's fun, but it is slow. It, it is so slow to shift. Um, and I don't do that much performance driving. I love performance cars, but I don't do that much performance driving. Um, you know, an automatic transmission does the job for me. You know, it's funny because I learned, um, when I first started driving, I learned on stick shift and I burned out many a clutches, like a lot, a lot, a lot. Right. Ooh. Um, but that, that was a great question, Daryl. Thank you. Um, as we're about to wrap up and I'm going to let Anthony, Anthony, do you have any questions first or do you want to save it for the end? We're about to go into the insane lightning round. Let's go to the insane lightning round. All right. So, Ed, this was researched especially for you. Uh -oh. One thing that I read about you and you just finished talking about is that you love to cook, right? So I paired that you love to cook with that you love to travel, right? And you've been everywhere as you were, you know, you were talking, you take trips to Japan every year, which I, I probably think you'll skip this year and probably go in 2021. Yeah right? Italy, you've been everywhere. So our insane lightning round is based on food from around the world. And it's a would you rather. You have to pick one. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Here we go. So to start, um, we're going to start with uh, crispy tarantula spiders from Cambodia or tuna eyeballs from Japan. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta be kidding. I take the spiders. <laughs> There's just, it's just something chewy about the eyeballs. It's just too much for me. I take the <laughs> All right. The next one is white egg, white and egg soup from Laos or jelly mousse nose from Canada. And these are real things. What was the first one? <laughs> white and egg soup or, you know, or jellied moose nose from Canada. I'll take the soup. you take the soup? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm kind of interested in that one. You know? <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> and he take the soup. <laughs> Let's go. All right, next one. Deep fried locust from Israel or fried chicken feet from South Africa. Fried chicken feet. Fried chicken. <laughs> Fried chicken feet. Yeah. But That's only if they're from South Africa. Yes, from South Africa. They probably okay. Know the spices might be different, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So the next one is a century egg from China, meaning this egg was a hundred is a hundred years old. Or wasp crackers from Japan. You may have tried those. I think the wasp crackers from Japan. I'd rather you have that. A 100-year-old egg? You wouldn't No. Know. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. There's not enough red wine in China for me to do that. <laughs> All right. And the last one, the last one is Swiftlet bird nest soup from Southeast Asia or kangaroo meat soup from Australia. The first one was from Cambodia? The first one was from Southeast Asia. That's South, what, Southeast Asia? Yeah. Uh, I think I'd go with that. I'd have to go with that because I think Southeast Asia, everything's got a lot of flavor and, you know, it's just, yeah, I'd go with that. So in Australia, they don't flavor their kang kangaroo meat correctly? <laughs> oh, they probably do, but, you know, I... <laughs> All right, I see I'm, 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 I'm trying to think. I may have had kangaroo before. No, I haven't. No. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time in Australia, but I don't remember having kangaroo. <laughs> I have a couple extra questions that have come up in the chat, and, I, and they're good, so I want to make sure. Um, this is Marlena okay. Bolton, and it's one of the students' moms. Um, so she says, driving that car allows you to live physics instead of just learning about it. Is there, or is there a car that kind of, is that your question, Marlena? I think that may be her question, but I'm a little bit confused by it. And the question's for Jim? 
No, I, I think it was for, I think it's for either of you guys. It says driving a car that allows you to live physics instead of just learning about it. And I feel like that ties back to one of the cars that we were talking about earlier. Yeah, I, I, maybe, I, maybe I can take that one um, okay. uh, on, on uh, the Corvette, for example. Uh, this is a car, uh, the C8 and, and C7, the, the previous generation had similar attributes. It has uh, the ability to go zero to 60 in under three seconds. Um, it has top speed, you know, kind of nearing 200 miles an hour in that range. Uh, but it has, um, it has the ability uh, to corner. It's called lateral acceleration. We measure that in terms of G-forces of over one G. And so it's an amazing combination of top speed, zero to 60 acceleration and the ability to really, uh, you know, really corner uh, very aggressively and the car holds, it has lateral acceleration of over one G, that's very high. And so that's a great combination for performance um, on the track, especially. So I appreciate that. And that, it, that, that doesn't happen by accident it is very intentional. And again, it's a combination of the work that uh, Ed's design team, Ed and his team, did combine with Ted Juchter and the engineering team for Corvette. A lot of learning from what we learned in motorsports from our Corvette racing team. Uh, we and then our propulsion team all working together. And and Ted, uh, uh, Ed talked about the tire technology we use Michelin's on our Corvettes, and we put that all together. And that's how you can really experience the physics uh, that we learn in the classroom in a vehicle that we race on the track. And obviously, the same would apply for on the street. So and you know what, I, I think to Jim's point, the difference between a front engine car versus a mid engine car versus a rear engine car like a 911 and the dynamics, the physics that happened there in cornering uh, more so than straight line. Yep, absolutely. Are, are quite different. Yeah. Great examples. Okay, cool. So we're nearing the end. So Anthony, if you have any last questions. Um, listen, this, this has been uh, phenomenal. This has been remarkable to be honest with you. Um, I think that, um, Ed, I guess, I guess my final question um, for Ed would be, um, Ed, as far as your sneaker design goes, are you planning on going further with your design of footwear? I mean, are you looking to link in with a, uh, a Nike or uh, a company to, um, you know, to, um, I guess, become a part of those companies? Are you looking to, to do your own company? What are you looking to do with that? Well, I would, uh, my preference would be to link in with an existing company. I'm very interested in doing that. I've got some feelers out. Um, I, I've been so focused on the designs and I'm still learning exactly, how do I communicate with them? How do I get in touch with them? It's, you know, here, here I am, I've got all this experience, all these years in one profession, and I'm kind of a rookie here in another one. Uh, other than the fact that from a design perspective, I think I've got something quite interesting I'm doing, but how to communicate with those companies is something very new to me. And I'm learning. To help with that. Well, I'm a big sneakerhead, so I, I would love to see the designs. Uh, well, there's, <laughs> there's a lot of it here. <laughs> Yeah, we're a, 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 we're we're very close with the folks from the Jordan brand and Nike. Okay. okay. So we might we might be able to help help with that potentially, you know, because um, I'm a big we're big big sneakerheads over here too. So I guess another question I have for you is: so are your sneakers more performance based or design or design based for you? Uh I think both. You know, it's it's funny. You know the sneaker industry is so huge right now just right. so much going on but as i look at it when i look at most of the designs they don't look fast mm -hmm. i mean they're big they're clunky they're mm -hmm. awkward mm -hmm. they may look cool but they don't look athletic i mean everything that i sketch as soon as you open the box it looks fast and that's mm -hmm. that's my whole kind of design philosophy sleek and fast and uh i don't know i you know who knows maybe you know because there's so much going on and the industry is so strong right now but what's next that's the question right. what's next that's true so with that said ed 
I want to thank you so, so much for coming on and taking, you know, this time out of your day. Jim Campbell, as always, you know, I love you, brother. Um, so what I want to do is, Ed, can you let everybody know where they can find you? Social media, websites, wherever. Well, I'll oh. his Instagram. So you guys, with his Instagram is at Ed Wellburn, his name. You can do the rest of it. Yeah, because, you know, I, I'll be very honest. I, you know, it's just the other day I was sitting at Facebook and I'm just not going to be a whole lot of content there because I'm fairly new at it. And uh, who knows, maybe that, that'll change a bit. I, uh, and that's pretty much it for now. You know, I try to live, it may sound like a fast, it is fast paced, but it's, I try to keep things fairly simple. And so, under control. Yeah, so I trust the pandemic has kind of made you push out there into that digital world a little bit more than you actually wanted to. Yeah, I, you know, I'm very comfortable being at home and designing and writing and setting up conference calls and with everyone. I, uh, you know, we're having a lot of fun here on this, but, you know, this virus is very serious. I, and I take it very serious. And mm -hmm. I don't think I'm going to be totally comfortable until there's a vaccine. And uh, yeah, it doesn't mean I'm not going to go out. I'm going to go out and I interact with people. But uh, it's, it's, this is no joke, you know. Yeah, you can't. I would agree. So Jim, where can we find you? And a funny story about Jim, I feel like I may have been the one to turn you on to Instagram. You did, you were the one, you were the one, <laughs> you were the one. I'm, uh, I'm on Twitter at Campbell Jim, uh, and I and by the same name on Instagram. So thank you for introducing me. Because of our uh, uh, two sides of our team on racing, we have the competition side that's about really working with our, our team owners and our drivers and, and the crew chiefs on how do we give them the best tools and parts and processes to you know, uh, win races and, and drive towards championships. Then we have another part of our team that does marketing and marketing activation. So we're often uh, learning about and understanding all the social media platforms. And so we're, uh, we're exploring TikTok now. And, uh, and also uh, Periscope's been around for a while. We, we, we have a little bit of activity there, but. Uh, primarily for me, it's Instagram and Twitter. I love TikTok. <laughs> it's so it's fun. has a TikTok page, so we got to make sure to connect. Yes. And I'm trying to find the right content because, you know, every content for every page is different. And this is a whole nother conversation that I'm not going to get into. But um, I'm trying to find, so I'm going to stop. Is it Team Chevy? You know what? We're just, we're exploring it right now. At one point, we'll probably have it up as Team Chevy. We're, we're learning all about it right now. And I know probably- well, Let me know as soon as, and we'll send all of our fans yeah, to you that's back. Great. That's great. Yeah, just my, uh, my, my wife has dragged me into a little bit of TikTok. Yeah, but, you know. Oh, wait, what's your wife's handle so I can go stalk her too? <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll let you know afterwards. <laughs> hey, Michelle and <clears throat> Michelle and, and, and Anthony and John and, and Ed, I just, just before we, we close out here, uh, thank you to the students who are on uh, for this duration and, and, and staying with us. Awesome. And I, what I'm really reminded of is that over 5,000 students have gone through the school. And now there's another class that is going to have some fun in the classroom and then get to the track at one point and make some great friendships and learn from one another. And it's just been an amazing, uh, amazing uh, time here today to be with you guys. Thanks for having me. Oh, thank you for having thank for you. coming on, Jim. Like this was great. When we found out that you wanted to come on, I was so excited. I was like, yay, because I barely get to I see you more now under the pandemic. <laughs> That's right. And John, thanks for what you're doing on the racetrack. And Ed, yeah, it's always great you. to see you, my friend. Anthony, yeah. thank you as well. It's great to see you, Jim. Yeah. Good seeing you guys. And we, we, we love we love you guys. And um, for the kids out there, don't forget um, your projects to do. So what's happening on Wednesday, John Cohen? For class? Uh, on Wednesday, you guys have to come up with your favorite commercial and how did it affect you with asking your parents to that you wanted to buy that product for you. And also, it's, what was the second? That's a great sub. Oh, oh, also, too, I want to know what your activation would be for your potential sponsor um, going, into, going into the deck. 
So you guys make sure that you're checking your emails because all of the past um, classes are in there. The replays for the classes are in there. Your assignments are on there, your homework assignments, plus the topic for next week, which will allow you to kind of, you know, go ahead and do some advanced work if you want to, to kind of be ready. But with that said, I want to thank you guys so much. You guys, this is the UIRS virtual STEM class and conversations today on Saturday. It was brought to you by Team Chevy. Um, we just appreciate it, you guys. So we'll see you back here next week. We'll have Ed, another awesome guest. Go ahead, um, Anthony. No, I was saying thank you, Ed Welburn. Thank you, Jim Campbell. Thank you, John. Thank, thank you. Every, thank you, everyone. All right. Thank you. All right, you guys. Okay. Have Stay right, in guys. touch. Okay. Absolutely. Bye-bye. Right. Bye.